Pandelius, Dr. Nick Pandelius, please come up here. Let's just give a round of applause. My name is Nick Pandelitis. I'm from uh, York, Pennsylvania. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I'm the vice president of the Pennsylvania chapter of the Docs for Patient Care. The Docs for Patient Care is a group that uh, came together about uh, two years ago when the AMA endorsed the uh, president's health care law. And we're dedicated to the repeal of that law and actually passing true reform that we need to lower costs, improve access, and to, uh, to maintain patient and physician freedom of medical decision making. All right, so what do we got here? Open folder. I don't know why it's a little blurry. It seems like a blurry down in the bottom. The best we can do in your slideshow. Yeah, maybe just leave a little lights on the back. Yeah. <laughs> It right, doesn't look too horrible, guys. Can you read it? No, that's fine. All right. The big words, yeah. Is there an X stage? Do not scan. Do not scan it yet. All right. Yeah, I'm just, I think maybe, uh, maybe I can put this thing here. Yeah, that's fine. That way I'll get out of the way, but it slides. In case I don't have a way to. Do you want to mind seeing this? Low and advance it. Oh, there it goes again. Dude, we don't, we don't want to scan that. <laughs> All right, you're fine. Uh, yeah, so just uh, as we go, my battery is not working for the advanced, but if you just push the button and you grab the chair. So. Anyway, um, the, the topic tonight is the exchanges, but I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about uh, health care reform. Why, why the push for health care reform, how uh, Obamacare really doesn't achieve this, the goals of lowering the health care costs, and uh, what, what true reform should look like. And I think that will help put the, the, the discussion that Katie is going to be talking about uh, on, the, uh, on the exchanges sort of the, to, to give it a framework to understand it better. And are we, are we in focus there? Or? Yep. More or less, okay. Next, yeah, more or next, less, it's not going to be any better, next, I don't think. That, that's great. Next slide, please. So, why, why the, uh, the need for health care reform? Well, there was a lot of talk about the uninsured people with uh, pre existing conditions, and that is important, but the reality is the problem in health care is it's way too expensive. It's bankrupting families and individuals, small, large businesses, and our government at all levels. Um, next slide, please. Having said that, if we can lower costs, the access issue improves. This is a slide that shows that right now, uh, federal tax revenues, 13% of all federal tax revenues, are used to cover shortages in Social Security and Medicare. Within 20 years, it, that those two things alone will consume nearly 50% of all federal revenues. And if you add into that Medicaid and the interest on the national debt, there is no money left. That's great. Uh, next slide, please. Medicare has an unfit, unfunded uh, liability of $38 trillion, and it's, a, it's another number that can't even be understood. But basically, the, uh, the Medicare trustees gave a report last year, and they said, looking over the next 75-year horizon, that Medicare will spend, uh, will spend $38 trillion more than it takes in. If we were to budget for that, for that Social Security and Medicare, for the upcoming cost, we would have to have another six trillion dollars in the budget, right? So our budget is already deficit a trillion dollars. Add to that seven trillion, it, the entitlements are completely unsustainable. Uh, Medicaid, um, <coughs> Medic uh, Medicaid started as a small program for the for, for the people that are poor, and is now a four hundred billion dollar program and is growing. And most of us know that it's an expensive entitlement. Uh, but what what a lot of people don't recognize or know is what terrible insurance it actually is. Uh, the people that are on Medicaid have difficulty accessing doctors, and as a result, their, their, their medical outcomes and surgical outcomes are not nearly as good. There was a study uh, done in, uh, at the University of Virginia where they, they looked at, it was almost 800 surgical cases, and complication rates, mortality rates were all much higher in Medicaid. Um, next uh, slide, please. So if the issue is 
health care is too expensive, bankrupting families, businesses, and our country. You have to say, why, why is it uh, bankrupting? Uh, why is it so expensive? And we'll be talking about the four drivers of health care uh, costs. The first is, uh, next slide please, thanks. Oh, yeah. um, the first is the third party payer system. Healthcare insurance is not like your auto or your home where you get it to protect yourself from an unexpected event. What it is, is really a prepayment financial scheme that encourages overutilization and discourages transparency regarding costs and, and, and regarding outcomes. So imagine how much your auto insurance would cost if it paid for your gas, your oil changes, uh, and a new car. Um, the part of the problem is if somebody else is paying the bill, we don't make decisions as wisely. And even worse, we've also given up that money for somebody else to pay the bill. So we feel, so we feel compelled to use them to, to use health care because we paid into our employer's program, we've paid our taxes, and at the same time, because someone else is paying for it, we don't make those decisions wisely. Five out of six dollars in health care are paid by third party payer which means that when you and I decide on average to, to utilize a healthcare service, we're only paying 15 cents on a, dollar's worth of, uh, on, a, on a dollar's worth of care. Let me just give you two examples. We've all seen the commercial on television. Uh, if Medicare qualifies you, you get this scooter for free. I mean, we're talking about a couple thousand dollars worth of material. Um, in my practice, I'm a, I'm a spine doctor. I see a lot of patients. I'll evaluate them. I'll say, this is the plan. And not infrequently, somebody will say to me, I'd like to have an MRI done. I say, well, you don't need an MRI at this point. It's not going to help me take good care of you. But I want the MRI done. Um, so I can spend time arguing with them, or most times simply just to, to uh, order the MRI. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing it does, on the provider side, there's very little accountability or transparency. Uh, people don't go to the doctor who is the best doctor, they go to the doctor who's on their health care plan. And if you try to get information about you know, who, uh, who performs the best spine surgery, who does the best heart surgery, those things are difficult to find. And because people aren't paying the bill themselves, they don't really push for that information. And the way the third party payer system, you could be the worst doctor or the best doctor, and they, and they pay you the same. Um, next slide, please. Unwise health care insurance <coughs> regulation. We all buy our health care within the state, and across the country, each state has anywhere between 20 and 40 <coughs> mandated coverages. They can be things such as drug and alcohol rehab, infertility, massage, coverage for domestic partners, coverage for dependent family members, and all these coverages can be helpful and useful at times, but they all have a cost. You know, there's no such thing as free health care. Somebody gets stuck with the bill, and right now it's uh, taxpayers and, and, and future taxpayers. It was estimated that these mandates, on average, increase the price of health care premiums anywhere between 25 and 50 percent. So it prices health care insurance out of the reach of many people who could otherwise afford a more basic policy. And they're not making that decision. The government has told them, you have to buy this policy with all these coverages. Uh, next slide, please. The federal tax policy. Uh, as you probably know, if you get your insurance through your employer, you get that as a tax-free benefit. You don't pay state ta uh, income tax, you don't pay federal income tax, you don't pay Social Security, you don't pay, um, uh, you, you, you don't pay your Medicare tax. Right off the bat, um, it's a very regressive tax, right? So the, the higher your the higher your income, the higher your tax bracket, the better, the better break you get from the government. It's exactly opposite of what it, it, it should be. But it has at least two negative effects in addition. First of all, we don't, as 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 employees, we don't really we don't really own that insurance. If we lose our job, we basically lose our insurance because it becomes unaffordable. You have to pay your part, the employer part, and portion of the taxes. Um, the, 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 the Center for Disease Control in 2008 looked at the entire population of the uninsured. Uh, and what they found, nearly 25% of the people who were uninsured were uninsured simply because they had just lost their jobs. So that, goes, that would suggest that by changing this federal tax policy so that people actually own their own policies, you could significantly decrease the numbers of the uninsured. The other thing that happens is 
<coughs> there isn't a lot of choice, there isn't a lot of competition, and costs are higher. Let me give you an example. Uh, take the Hershey Food Corporation, right? Thousands of employees in Pennsylvania. When they go to buy a health care insurance policy for their employees, their goal is to buy the policy that their employees will find acceptable, that's the least expensive. And on the other side of the, the market interaction, you have a health care insurance company that's looking to sell the policy that will make them the most money. Nowhere in that calculation is what's the best policy for any individual employee. So somebody might, might be young of childbearing age and need to have good coverage uh, for the delivery of kids and taking care of kids. Other people may be older, but they would need you know, infertility coverage or, or things along that line. Other people may have diabetes and, and uh, would want to get a, a, a package that dealt with their diabetes better. So all that gets cut out because the HR department is making that decision for the rest of us and it's because of this misguided federal tax policy. I'm sorry I'm going, going kind of fast, but I'm going to try to get this in in 20 minutes and I'll be very happy to answer questions uh, in the end. Um, medical malpractice abuse. Uh, ne next uh, slide, please. Uh, the annual health care bill in this country is around $2 trillion. And the lawyers will say, geez, medical malpractice direct, direct costs, it is economic, co economic costs, uh, pain and suffering, the legal costs, is only $35 billion, a drop in the bucket. But in fact, the amount of money that is spent by physicians and others to prevent lawsuits is many times greater. It's estimated to be $190 to $240 billion a year for practicing defensive medicine. The uh, con con Congressional Budget Office had estimated that an appropriate package of tort reform would decrease federal health care expenditure by $54 billion over 10 years. Federal health care expenditure is about half of the entire bill. So that means there'd be another $54 billion or so on the private side. So uh, is Obamacare, thank you, is Obamacare reform? Well, not really. It doesn't address any of the critical drivers. We talked about the third party payer. It expands the third party payer system. It adds more insurance regulation, more mandates, driving up the cost and decreasing competition. It does not address the misguided federal tax policy, which promotes employer-provided insurance over individually purchased insurance, and there's no provision for substantive tax re uh, re tort reform. Now, next slide, please. But it's okay. It works in a very simple manner, and here's a, here's a picture of how it works. So uh, let me just point out a couple of things. Uh, the entire health care system now revolves around the Secretary of Health and Human Services, currently Catherine Sebelius, a lawyer and a bureaucrat. Uh, a little hard to see, but up in the right-hand corner is you, patients. And I think doctors are somewhere down here. So uh, don't worry, it will all work out fine. So this is the largest expansion. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. All right. This is the largest expansion of federal bureaucracy in U.S. history. Thousands of pages of regulations, 159 new commissions. When, when the, uh, whatever the agency was asked to calculate how many federal employees they would need to enact the law, they could not come up with the number. They said it was incalculable. Uh, next. So what were we told? We were told it was going to cost a trillion dollars over 10 years. Um, and that trillion dollar, uh, sorry, next slide. Please. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that trillion dollars uh, was going to be paid for by uh, $500 billion of, of new taxes on wages, on investment, medical dev devices, health insurance, and $575 uh, billion dollars of, of savings in, uh, in, in, in Medicare. So only, only the, uh, the government can call uh, cuts uh, savings. Um, but the, as Paul Ryan pointed out when they first came out, these, these numbers were completely false, and let me spend a little time explaining that. So that $1 trillion was, was when the law was first passed, and at that time, the law wasn't going to be implemented for four years. So it was based on 10 years of tax collections, but only six years of expenditure. So now that we're four years closer, the true 10-year cost is not $1 trillion, it's $2.3 trillion. That number was also based on expanding uh, Medicaid by uh, 16 million people. Uh, we talked about before, Medicaid is a terrible health care um, coverage. 
but the true number is probably closer to 26 million. It qualifies almost immediately another four or five million people, but in, in the course of doing that, there are already, ple pe there are already people out, out there who, who would qualify for Medicaid now that just haven't. Uh, and in the process of qualifying the new people, you would have, uh, the number again would be 26. So not 16, 26. So 50% more people. And then uh, they estimated 19 million people would go into the exchanges. Let me just say a couple words about the exchange because it's a little bit confusing. You hear, you hear exchange and you think of something like Travelocity. Some place where you can go where there will be lots of competition, lots of choices, and as a result you will get what you need at the best price. In fact, the Obamacare exchange will be selling essentially three versions yeah, it's gold, silver, and platinum or something, bronze <coughs> level, of a very similar policy that's highly regulated, highly mandated, uh, will be an expensive policy. And there will only be a few large insurance companies who will be selling the policy, so very little uh, competition. But what the exchange truly is, is a new federal bureaucracy that will enforce the mandate, including reporting to the IRS. It will enforce the insurance regulations and it will manage the hundreds of billions of dollars of new uh, deficit federal tax, uh, federal, federal deficit spending dollars that will be uh, flowing through the exchanges to pay for the subsidies. And again, you know, the idea of uh, more people having insurance and be more affordable, it's a great idea, but you can't make it happen just by saying so, and you can't make it happen when it's based on this type of financial model, which is completely uh, unsustainable. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, really, it will, it, if this were implemented, which it's so complicated and so bad, it'll never be fully implemented uh, otherwise. But it is, it's not. It's going to cost trillions and add to that already ludicrous 16 trillion dollar um, uh, national debt that we have. Okay. Um, you know, they say, oh, it's just, we're just helping out the private market. It's not a federal type takeover of health care. Next slide, please. In fact, the federal government will determine what the essential health care benefits are, what every inch. They will try to enforce them, and uh, Mr. Ryo will explain to you why they can't, but they will try to tell people in Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania insurers what has to be in there. It creates over 150 boards that will control every aspect of health care. Next slide, please. Um, so, starting in 2015, a qualified health plan is al allowed to contract with medical providers only if such provider implements such mechanisms to improve health care quality as the secretary. That, you know, this, Captain Sebelius is going to tell doctors how they're supposed to practice made by regulation required. What they're talking about is developing protocols to take care of the average patient who has this problem. And while such protocols are, can, can be interesting to look at, uh, to, to, to test against reality, there is no such thing as the average patient. The patient I'm treating is the patient in front of me. And that patient may not benefit, in fact, could be hurt by the average patient treatment dictated by the, uh, uh, by the Secretary of Human and Health Services. So physicians would put in a position where they either follow the rules uh, to get paid or to be pe or, or not follow the rules and get penalized, and the patient is stuck in the middle. Uh, oh, you're good. There. Okay. You all heard about the IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. That it's a, a board uh, um, uh, appointed by the president. The Senate has to to uh, approve them, and then they, without congressional approval, can can make any cuts they want to uh, to Medicare to to maintain a spending limit annually. Next step. Uh, yeah. So, um, the uh, how how might this work out from a financial and healthcare perspective? Well, the uh, the experience in Massachusetts, where, where God, Governor Romney had passed the Commonwealth Care, was very similar to um, uh, Obamacare in a couple of respects. The first is there was an individual mandate that is you have to buy insurance, and the second was that insurance companies had to provide uh, coverage regardless of pre-existing condition. Uh, let me just talk a, a little bit about the, uh, that last mandate that I, that I mentioned. You know, it sounds all fine and good that the insurance companies have to take all providers. 
Um, that's what the guaranteed issue is. But the, what, what they found was, and what's going to happen, is responsible people like you and I will buy insurance because we want to protect ourselves and protect our families. But other people will decide they're not going to buy the insurance because when they need it, the insurance companies have to give it to them. And not only that, because of the second part of the mandate called community rating, the insurance companies are not allowed to charge people who are bringing problems into the insurance pool more money for the risks and the expenditure they're going to bring into that pool. It would be like saying that a person who has been convicted, you know, has had drunk driving, you know, and has two or three accidents, uh, the insurance company would be forced to, to provide them with auto insurance and they would be forced to, to charge them the same rate as uh, a safe driver. You know, obviously that will just spiral and crash because the price of the insurance will keep going up and people people like you and I who want to buy it will no longer be able to afford it, which means there will be fewer healthy people in, in it, price goes up and it's just a, a death spark. Next slide. In fact, what they found was that after implementing um, uh, uh, the Massachusetts Commonwealth Care, they had the highest health insurance premiums in the country. Uh, just because somebody has a card that says they have health insurance doesn't mean they can see a doctor, right? I mean, it's not the same thing. And uh, expanding Medicaid uh, makes an access problem for the Medicaid patients uh, even worse. Um, in Massachusetts, they had the, the longest wait times, over two months to see an uh, OBGYN doctor, over 40 days to see orthopedics, and also uh, the longest times uh, to see primary care doctors. So as a result, these people with cards who said they were insured, they ended up in the emergency room when they needed care. Costs have, have, have exploded from $133 uh, million uh, in 2007 to $800 million in, in 2010. Um, across the uh, country, the average expenditure for health care uh, by state government is around 25%, already a huge number. In Massachusetts, it's over 40%. Next slide. So uh, I'll just let you read this. So this was the this was the Democrat uh, uh, state treasurer in Massachusetts. What uh, they thought of um, the Commonwealth Care after it had been implemented for uh, a couple of years. Doesn't sound too promising. So what do we know so far about Obamacare? We were told that premiums would uh, go down by $2,500. In fact, they've increased by nearly uh, $2,500. Insurance is expected to increase by another 30 or 40 percent if the additional mandates and regulations which are coming up this year and next year kick in. One of the things that happens is, again, you're not allowed to, to charge higher premiums to people that bring higher costs to the system, including younger people. So. Um, the health care insurance for young people who are probably the least capable for affording insurance, right? They, they haven't been working very long, they have young families, their insurances are likely to double, um, which means more and more of them will go uh, uncovered. Um, the, uh, it, it, what you'll hear, well, it's okay that insurance is going to be more expensive because what, what happens is uh, you will get subsidies from the federal government and um, it'll pay for the insurance, and, and that may be true, but the money is going to be printed. That money uh, doesn't exist. Um, there's one thing, let me go back to uh, the exchanges because uh, I, I don't think I explained uh, one thing well enough that I wanted to say. Uh, the estimate was that 19 million people would go to the exchanges. Douglas Holtz, he could have former CBO director said, no, it's going to be more like twice as many, and some people think that even more. Now, why should that be? Well, on the employer side, the employers with more than 50 employees are going to have a choice of either providing the mandated insurance, which is estimated to cost about $15,000 or more uh, with all the regulations. You pay 60% of that premium, that's uh, uh, you know, around $8,000, or they can pay a penalty, a tax, now apparently it's a, a tax, of $2,000 or $3,000 depending on the employee's situation, and then um, they can turn their employees over to the exchange. Um, the reality is, as, as you all know, 
these medium-sized businesses uh, are already under huge pressures because of over-regulation and over-taxation. And it's just simple arithmetic. Uh, paying $3,000 is less than paying $8,000. On the employee side, uh, there'll, there'll be advantages for the employees to go into the exchange rather than getting employer-provided insurance. Again, we said um, the way the subsidies works, uh, if, you, if you make less than 133% of the poverty level, you get shoved into Medicaid, that terrible system that takes terrible care of people. Between 133% of the federal uh, poverty level, which is not a big income by any means, and 400%, which is about $90,000. Now, $90,000 is a pretty good income. And there are, there are significant federal tax subsidies within the current plan. But let's look at the, at the bottom end of that scale, the person that is around 133% um, of poverty. If they get a policy, that $15,000 policy, from their employer, they're going to have to pay part of that. The federal subsidy they get is because they're not paying any federal income tax, the federal subsidy they get is the 15% from Medicare and Social Security. So that 15% on 15,000 uh, uh, dollars is uh, roughly, what, $2,400, something like that. Mm -hmm. If they go into the exchange, then they get a subsidy of closer to uh, $14,000. So if there are two different companies out there, right, looking to hire Yes. sort of low-wage earners, if one company is paying the, paying the penalty and putting the, the person into the exchange where they get a much bigger subsidy and if the other one isn't, the one that isn't is going to have to pay out, you know, a, a higher wage, right? I mean, it's, it's ultimately dollars in your pocket. So the whole, the whole thing is so convoluted. Again, we want costs to go down, we want access to improve, uh, but this Obamacare is this huge monstrosity that's fiscally uh, Im impossible and operationally uh, not implementable. Okay, next slide, please. Let me just talk a little bit about what healthcare reform ought to look like, because again, there is definitely a, a, a need to lower costs. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about the third party payer system. What we need to do is move the money that we are all already uh, taking but giving to our insurance companies and to the federal government and keep that within our control. Because ultimately, as much as you want to rail against the insurance companies or the government when they tell you how you're going to receive your health care, the reality is they're paying the bill. You know? And so if they're paying the bill, they're going to say how that money is spent. But if you can keep that money, now you're in charge. Now, the way it ought to work um, is that Insurance should be sort of like it is for auto. For routine care, you want to pay those costs yourself, and you're 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 saving that money in savings accounts. This this is all the premium money that you've spent over the years. It's been estimated that for the average worker over the last 30 years, premiums over a million dollars. So I mean, control of that money. Uh, it will lead to more uh, wise healthcare decisions on consumers' parts. You know, you won't have. People telling doctors I want an MRI. When I recommend an MRI, they're going to they're going to they want a good reason for that. If I recommend a surgery, I need to show them data. People they talk about passing laws for transparency, and I think that's wonderful. I have no problem with it. But the reality is, if people are paying their bills, they're going to demand it. Just like you know how much a car costs, you know how good you know a, a blender is. Where the you know so that information will come through. On the on the provider side, even more will happen because now we'll be accountable for the money that you're spending because it's your it's your money. And the United States has always been this just brilliant place for innovation. And if somebody, for instance, has diabetes, do any of you have diabetes? So I, I, I don't know either. So you maybe see a kidney doctor, an endocrinologist, a surgeon from time to time. How coordinated is that care? Not two, right? You know, are the doctors talking to themselves? But now all of a sudden, the, you know, these doctors will say, hey, you know, we want to be the kidney and diabetes doctor. So they will say, we're going to offer you a package where we'll take care of your diabetes for this price annually. We're going to, and they're going to make the doctors talk to each other. They're going to do, um, they're going to, they're going to do what's most efficient for your care. 
So again, as much as people talk about consumer-centered health care, uh, people making wiser decisions, even more will happen on the demand side, on, on the supply side, on, on the doctors and providers side. Um, let me just talk about one other thing, the federal tax policy. We briefly talked about you know, why it's bad, but why would it be good? Imagine if rather than the employer gave you a policy you had to take, that they were able to give you a defined contribution. So uh, you know, an $8,000. Now, you have $8,000 with the same tax benefit, and you're going to go on the market. Now, let's go back to that Hershey situation. 5,000, 6,000 employees, one, previously one interaction on the market. Now you have 5,000 people making, that, uh, making their own purchases. And they're going to get the policy that best fits their needs from a pocketbook standpoint and from a health care standpoint. And if we can eliminate the mandates, you know, young, healthy people who don't have a lot of money, they can get a very basic policy. People who have diabetes, they can go buy a policy that best, best uh, serves, uh, serves their needs. Um, so there are definitely there are definitely ways to lower health care costs, and like all of us in this room know, like all good policy, that policy is based in freedom, personal responsibility, and personal choice. And whether you're talking health care or any other problem, uh, we all know that a it's right and, and, and b it works. Um, so anyway, that's uh, my first <coughs> talk on, on, on health care reform. Um, what, what the problems are in our current healthcare system and the direction we need to, to move uh, to actually lower costs uh, and to improve access. So uh, thank you very much. All right, well our next guest is Katie Abram from Americans for Prosperity. Let's give her a round of applause. Project. I was a stay-at-home mom, turned into Tea Party area, got really hacked off of what I heard about Obamacare coming down the pike. And um, in 2010, one of my Tea Party members, she was like, you need to talk to this guy from this group. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, it's Americans for Prosperity. They want to talk to you about running a phone bank. And I was like, okay. So I met this guy, Pete, who was a field coordinator with Americans for Prosperity. He was based out of our New Jersey chapter. And he said, what we want to do is work with Tea Party activists to run phone banks across the state of Pennsylvania. We're also doing this across the country um, in specific congressional districts to educate voters about their specific congressman. And my congressman at the time was Tim Holden, blue dog Democrat who just got eaten in the primary <laughs> earlier this year by a leftist. Um, <laughs> even worse. Uh, so we ran, I ran this phone bank, had never done anything like this before. I was never political, so I pretty much got thrown into the fire as many of us had, and a lot of learning curves along the way. Um, a few weeks after the election, um, we, with, in the state of Pennsylvania, AFP targeted seven congressional races. We flipped five of those seats. Um, unfortunately, mine was not one. <laughs> but I digress. We had a really bad Republican running. <laughs> but anyway, so about two, two, three weeks after the election, I got a call from Steve Lonigan, the New Jersey State uh, Director and asked if I'd be interested in working part-time for AFP. So being a stay-at-home mom, this was a great opportunity because I was able to work out of my home, and I still do, um, and it's great because we get to travel around the state. So with Americans for Prosperity, we don't advocate for any candidates. We actually advocate on policy, which is why what happened today with Governor Corbett was such a beautiful thing because um, Barack Obama, the leftists, they hate Americans for prosperity. Um, President Obama has called out AFP by name over 21 times in the past three years. And we were proud. <laughs> we wear that as a badge of honor. Um, but basically, what we did today, um, as many of you now, now know about the exchanges and may have known for a while, under Obamacare, each governor, each state was given one of three options under the law. Number one, the state could come out and create one of these exchanges or basically a website where you could go buy insurance. Option number two would be for the federal government to do it 
if the state decided to opt out, which is what happened today. The third option is that the state could do what I would consider a hybrid or a state-federal partnership. And the deadline for that is on February 15th in 2013, so a little bit from now. But <coughs> basically, what's happened over the past, oh gosh, how long has this been going on, Nick? <laughs> Forever, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we, we started this fight in March. I think, yeah, the yeah. Mm -hmm. towards the beginning of this year. So this has been a long, right. long battle. And I'm still, like, I'm still shaking from the governor coming out today. Like, I still haven't quite, you know, because it was like a, you know, this, he came out at 1.30 today. They sent a tweet out. And I was watching it when it hit. And I was like, ah, it happened. I was so excited. And, but then it was like, I, you know, we had press releases and all this. So I've kind of been going nonstop. And I feel like I haven't had a chance to exhale yet so if I'm still a little neurotic and excited that's why um, so let me give you an idea of what Americans for Prosperity has been doing you know over the past three years I would say since the T Mark party movement has really erupted and, and come to fruition we've all all the groups we've been trying to figure out you know what to do all the groups have different um, issues the Berks County Patriots are big into right to work we've got other groups that are big into health care and it runs the gamut I mean and the and the Fed you name it all over the place. Um, and it was hard for all the groups to come together to really have that collective voice. Because I know like when I when AFP came in through Lebanon County, like some of my group members are like, we don't want to be commandeered by a big national group. And I'm like, you can't be commandeered if you don't let somebody commandeer you. Um, but our state director, Jennifer Stefano, always puts it so nicely. She has a one-year-old and a three-year-old. And she said, you know what? This is the way I look at it. Like, we love working with conservatives and all the Tea Party groups, and she started a Tea Party group as well. And she said, you know, my kids have little friends over, and I like them to stay, and they play, and they have a good time, but I want them to go home afterwards. We don't want to watch everybody's group. So we love when everybody can come together and work towards a common goal, but everybody has their own issues, and that is the beauty of this movement. The autonomy of all the groups is pertinent to the survival of this Tea Party movement and the conservative movement. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. Um, so, let's go through this year as to what happened. You know, I had a really great presentation that I've been doing across the state all year long, and the governor completely screwed that up for me today. Um, <laughs> so instead we have cake afterwards, it's a celebratory cake, because we haven't had much to celebrate. I mean, in November, after you know President Obama was elected, I was devastated. I was completely devastated. You know, Ed here, here Ed Boyd's on our team. He's one of our field coordinators, and we worked so hard. You know, everybody in the movement worked so hard. You know, I was watching TV that yep. night, and you saw the states just going blue. And I'm like, oh, that's not what Dick Morris said. That's not what Paul Rove said. Um, so I'm still trying to get over that. So I'm going to enjoy today as much as I possibly can because we needed a win. Yep. So, yeah. Yes, we did. So this is good news. And actually, another win that we had this week, um, our AFP chapter in Michigan. Did anybody see what happened yesterday? Yeah. Michigan is now a right-to-work state. And the 10, I don't know if anybody saw the video of like Steve and Crowder getting punched multiple times. Oh, yeah. The tent that got, got torn down. That was an Americans for Prosperity tent, and our activists were inside. There were elderly people inside that. Um, one of my coworkers was inside there. She was a one-year-old, uh, actually a two-year-old, and um, they were getting kicked oh. after <coughs> the union guys <laughs> tore down the tent, and they were stuck under that tent. Yeah, um, that's right. Charges. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. There's video, and apparently the one guy that was uh, punching Stephen Crowder. It looks like we have photographic evidence that of him actually with Obama as well. Oh, really? Oh, 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 oh. It's a beautiful thing of Twitter. If anybody's on Twitter, you have to get on Twitter if you're not. But I digress. <laughs> so what's happened over this past year? As Americans for Prosperity and Dr. Pandelitis and some others have been crossing the state, educating people on these health exchanges. And like he said, you know, a health exchange is a website. That It sounds so harmless, <laughs> but it's a website. And basically, all the information that goes in those websites then gets fed up into the federal government's service hub, um, where all that's propagated. And you've got all the regulations and all the riffraff that's going on up there. There's exchanges of money. And the governor had an option to decide, basically, what he was going to do by this Friday. The deadline from Health and Human Services is this Friday. And Pennsylvania was the last state to make a decision. 
as to what they were going to do. And uh, we actually thought that the governor was going to wait till Friday, and then when we heard that he had uh, he was coming out today with an announcement, we were very excited, but we were really surprised. Um, this is a list of the states that first off rejected the exchanges and have said, no federal government, you do it. 26 states, and now Pennsylvania is on that list. Two of those states, Florida and Iowa, have asterisks next to them. They were originally against creating an exchange. Florida in particular, Governor Rick Scott down there, um, when he said that we are not going to create this exchange, we're going to let the federal government do it, Kathleen Sebelius and HHS said, we're going to withhold your Medicaid dollars. Yep. Guess who's on the fence now? Now, mind you, when the Supreme Court came out this summer, they said that the government cannot use Medicaid dollars as punishment against the state. So that was a win, and that was great for Florida. But Governor Rick Scott is now on the fence, and we're not quite sure which way he's going to go. Um, so we're keeping him on the rejected list at this point. We'll hopefully bring him back over to the right side of the line. We'll know by Friday. Um, six states have come out to do a hybrid or partnership with the federal um, government. And then we have 18 states plus, of course, Washington, D.C., as part of those states that are creating the exchanges for the federal government. Now, the interesting thing is <coughs> Governor Corbett, November of last year, the day before Thanksgiving break, accepted $34 million in federal money from Obama to create this exchange. Now, I'm hoping after what happened today, he will be returning that money to Obama with a big fat Christmas bow on it, saying we don't want it. So that remains to be seen. Now, um, the states that are creating them, a number of them already have exchanges in place. As Dr. Pandelis had said, Massachusetts is one of those states. Now, Massachusetts in particular, this, is, this will just give you an idea of what we'll be looking at as we move forward. When they created their exchange, and as it is basically up until today, has, it takes about $40 million per year to run that exchange. It's going to cost, they're looking at a projected additional $12 million per year to bring it up to the standards of Obamacare. Theirs doesn't even meet the federal requirements of Obamacare. Neither does Utah. Utah, they submitted their request in, say, please, you know, um, accept this as a great exchange. The federal government said, no, it does not fit our requirements. Amazing, isn't it? Now, let me go over to um, the press release from the governor today. And I know this is going to be difficult to see, so I'm going to read this to you. Um, while I bring this up, I want to explain to you, too, when, when I read this to you, there's some things that the governor said that are, that are really good, but he leaves the door open for some other things. Now, with these exchanges, every state is looking at an operational cost of running about between $10 million to $100 million a year to run the exchange. The federal government will siphon money into the states that are creating these exchanges up until 2015. 2015, the money stops from the federal government, and the burden is laid upon the taxpayer of each and every one of those states. Okay, so if the governor today would have said, we're going to create an exchange, Pennsylvania would be looking probably between 50 to $100 million in extra um, tax burden. And when you're looking at a population of 12 million roughly, about 6 million pay taxes in our state, think about how much your taxes are going to go up with a burden like that. And on top of that, we have the pension crisis that's coming up. Governor Corbett just stated that the pension crisis in the state of Pennsylvania is looking to eat up 65% of next year's budget. 65%. How about them apples? All right, so here's the, his press release. I'm going to read this to you. Um, so bear with me because I know the type's small. Uh, Governor Corbett, Tom Corbett, today released the following statement along with a letter to U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius regarding the state's decision on the establishment of a state-based health insurance exchange. For two years, my administration has been engaged in carefully planning around the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, continually seeking guidance from the federal government. Throughout this time, we've asked HHS questions to help determine costs and impacts and flexibility flexibility in order, in order to inform our decisions. I'm going to stop right there. This summer, Governor Corbett had sent Michael Constantine, the insurance commissioner from Pennsylvania, down to D.C. to testify in front of the House Ways and Means Committee looking for guidance as to how to create these exchanges. 
They just sent the guidance two days ago. It was 17 questions that they were asking that HHS sent out very, very vague guidelines. And what I find interesting is that, you know, the governor keeps saying, we need guidance, we need guidance. It's essentially like the federal government and HHS are saying, here, build a house, but I'm not going to give you blueprints. That's what's been going on this whole time. I think we checked it. Yeah, and we yeah, won't even write you a full check. Okay, until this week, less than five days before the deadline for a state-based exchange decision in Blueprint, we received little acknowledgement of those questions. Even HHS Secretary Sebelius recently admitted on a call with governors that the regulations released a few weeks ago were not final and that more drafts are to be expected. Healthcare reform is too important to be achieved through haphazard planning. Pennsylvania taxpayers and businesses deserve more. They deserve informed decision making and a strong plan that responsibly uses taxpayer dollars. Therefore, I have decided not to pursue a state-based health insurance exchange at this time. It would be irresponsible to put Pennsylvanians on the hook for an unknown amount of money to operate a system under rules that have not been fully written. However, we will continue to seek guidance from HHS on the cost, impacts, and flexibility involved in the different options for Medicaid expansion. And you saw the numbers from Dr. Pandelitis about Medicaid. Dear Lord, help us. We must work together on solutions that provide greater access to high quality and more affordable health care coverage for Pennsylvanians. Pennsylvania is one of uh, 28 states that has declared it will allow the federal government to operate its exchange. By law, the decision to establish a state-based exchange can be reevaluated by states each year. So that can be reevaluated. Re and what we're looking to do most likely, we have to have a meeting because we're still trying to get over that, what happened today. But most likely we're going to be pushing for some kind of legislation this coming session to put the power in the hands of the legislature. Because what a governor can do, let's say two years from now, we get a, you know, somebody else as our governor, mm -hmm. um, they could do executive order to create a, a state-based exchange. So we want to be able to block that preemptively if that would happen. So again, that will be coming down the pike. Let's just enjoy this for now. <laughs> yeah. All right, the exchange decision letter to HHS along with three previous um, letters to HHS from the administration can be found by clicking Affordable Care Act News on their website, insurance.pa.gov, if you want more information on that. So, this is a good day though. <laughs> Despite him leaving the door open for Medicaid, um, I am just beyond ecstatic and excited because this has been a great week for the conservative movement. We've got Michigan, yes. Michigan, the yeah. home of Detroit and Blight <laughs> is now a right to work state and Pennsylvania now a lot of the state. Thank you. Now, I, I do want to explain to you kind of what we did in regards to our community organizing skills and I hate that term but really that's what we did. Um, AFP decided, you know what? We're going to take the bull by the horns and run with this, and whoever wants to follow is going to follow. Simple as that. So um, our great field coordinators, we've got Ed Boyd, Matt Hissy, and uh, Randy DeSoto, um, and Jennifer Stefano and I have been working diligently with gra the grassroots across the state. We've been holding conference calls, basically setting up various call bombs into the governor's office. Um, we were told they have received, and I quote, thousands of calls into his office. Um, also into leadership in the House and Senate as well, just applying that pressure in strategic ways. We had um, forms online uh, after some conference calls that we had with activists to go online, sign up for a specific time on a specific date. We had Tea Party groups adopting specific days over the past, I think it's been the past week basically, just driving, hammering, nonstop drumbeat because that's what the left does. And we have we have a movement haven't been effectively doing that, but we have such so many great groups in the state. Everybody came together and knocked it out of the ballpark, and it was beautiful. We did Twitter bombs. I mean, if you're on Twitter, find me at AFP Pennsylvania on, on Twitter. We've been hammering them on Twitter, which sounds so crazy. Um, we've been hammering them on Facebook um, today uh, on Governor Corbett's last post on Facebook. I went on there right before I drove out here, and there were hundreds of people saying thank you. And that's one thing we have to remember as well. For as much as Governor Corbett has frustrated the heck out of me, and I really think we should be a right to work state already, but I digress, um, we have to thank them. It's much easier to 
you know, use a carrot than a stick. And I think as a movement, we use the stick a lot, and rightfully so, mind you. But we do need to use the carrot. And I, I know that when, with what happened today, um, our state director got a call from Governor Corbett's office, literally like two seconds, she said, after the initial tweet went out that he was rejecting the exchange, and they told us a good job. So they know that we all are powerful. And we're going to keep reminding them of that. And, you know, I don't know what the next issue is going to be after health care. I'm sure it'll be one thing after another. And there's always going to be battles that we're going to be fighting. This next year, one of our agenda items is Agenda 21. And for me, that moment. And we actually had a win with that um, <coughs> months ago in Bucks County. They were trying to push through um, a township ordinance in, I'm trying to think which township it was. I can't remember, Upper, Upper Mayfield, I believe, they're trying to push through basically an Agenda 21S type zoning ordinance where people along a certain route weren't going to be able to change like the color of their front door without having to go through the township, and we stopped it. And so that kind of thing is what we're going to be focusing on, more of those local battles, school board battles, you name it, we're there. It doesn't take a lot to organize for something like that. If we can organize statewide for something like this, we can do it so easily so easily with you guys locally. So if anything comes up, please let us know. Um, we'll be more than happy to help. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. Cake, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna do that. Like, call Bob tomorrow and say thank you. Well, that was good that, well, you know what? There is actually a conference call at nine o'clock tonight to thank all the activists, and I know we've been here, so yeah, the email already went out. I don't know. That's actually a really good idea. I would suggest tomorrow call the governor's <coughs> office and just say thank you. You guys, we were supposed to. You were supposed to do that. Yeah, we call actually, because um, each group, the AFP, was supposed to. Uh, Organize a, a call bomb, you know, get all these activists together, each group. Uh, we chose a day through AFP. We chose Thursday, which oh, is today awesome. or tomorrow. <laughs> so, hey, you know what? Um, we have it on Facebook and Twitter. We got tons of people that already confirmed RSVP'd on Twitter or Facebook. So, we're just going to still call. We're going to call them and say thank you, you know, because we got to hold them accountable. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, now we're going to have, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, William Tyler Real, right? Close enough. He's going to speak about nullification. Yes. Great conversation. Let's give it up. Do we need this projector anymore? I don't know. Um, of you know what nullification is? That's about half. That's great. Uh, first of all, I agree with Katie. This was a tremendous effort, not only by AFP, which is terrific, but a lot of different groups were involved. And coming together is what's really important. I just happened to have written a civil action plan in 2009, and the first item on that civil action plan is to learn the truth, work with people you know, and get your groups organized, and then go with other groups and help them do their thing, as long as it's lawful, so they'll help you. That's what this is all about, because I don't think there's one group, I don't care whether you got thousands and thousands of members, that's going to have any impact in Harrisburg, much less Washington, um, unless we do that. You can't be big enough, all right? And you can't be knowledgeable enough, you have to keep studying. Now, my name is William Taylor Ryle, it's Austrian, uh, so, but call me anything, just call me for dinner. But the point <laughs> being is, if we don't learn what the cause is of this mess, we're going to keep following and fighting these brush fires. I make an analogy that here we have this massive grass field. And the government's throwing out bills, they're like fires, and they got us out there stamping all these fires out. Meanwhile, they're there with a gas hose spraying it on the field, and the, flare, the fires just come right up after we get off them. What do they do? They let you win this one, just like Corbett, and you're right. 
he's going to come back and bring it back. All right? Because it'll put him in good stead with the feds, and he gets funds from the feds. That's the deal. All right? Now, if it isn't this, it'll be something else. That's how the game is played. Now, I've been doing this for 23 years. There is a man, that's a long time. Well, yeah, it is. And uh, some people say, well, how's it working out for you? Well, it's frustrating at times, but this is a great day because you all, all of us across the state, proved that nullification works. Oh, wait a minute. Is what Governor Corbett just do, was that nullification? Yes. And it was because you said, do it in essence, or you're going to keep calling it. And they can't stand that. It's great. <laughs> Uh, my list is out of date, obviously, but I put Pennsylvania down there at 1.30 today, and uh, it's the only one that has a date and time, by the way. All right? So, what did we learn from this? First of all, how many of you have heard people say nullification isn't true, it doesn't work, it never has, so on? Not true. Okay? And I want to give you a real brief history and then share some things that I personally, in the group that I'm with, which is the County Sheriff Brigades of Pennsylvania, that's an umbrella group over uh, brigades that are in various counties. We'd love to have them in, 20, in, uh, in uh, 67 counties. I think we have about 22 active right now. Um, however, nullification is really very simple. It is simply not doing something that you determine is immoral or unconstitutional. Now, in order to do that, you've got to sort of understand those two principles very clearly, because if you're wrong, we also have to be responsible in a free society, right? Right. Well, I can spend hours telling you about that this is not a free society, and I can tell you exactly who, in many cases, has done it, and how it's gotten here, but that's for another day. Nullification is just that simple. I'm not going to do it. Or the county's not going to do it. Or the township's not going to do it. All right? Enforce some law that's made somewhere, it doesn't really matter, that has been determined by the sovereigns, that's us. Did you realize that you're the sovereigns? How many of you know that? Yes. Okay, you're the boss. In fact, the state constitution, if you don't have one, there's one over there. I really recommend that you get a copy. But Article 1, Section 2 says, all powers in the people. Well, let's go to the Declaration of Independence, the consent of the government. And the courts have determined this too. So it's not a foreign concept. So you're the boss. But we often forget that, don't we? We go to Harrisburg and we go with our hat in hand, oh, please do this. You know, wait a minute. They all work for us. The last time I checked, the boss gets to make the rules. Now, the rules happen to be in the Constitution. State Constitution first, and then the Federal Constitution, where they have delegated authority from the conventions that created the federal government, right? In the Federal Constitution. The last time I checked, the creation is always inferior to the Creator. God is the Creator, and we are in His servant, right? Right. Huh. The people created the state governments, Originally, there were colonies, right? And they said, England, we're not going to play with you anymore. And they said, we're going to be free. Now they had to fight a war for it. But they won that war. And the bottom line is, that resolution of the difference between Great Britain and the colonies was solved in the War for Independence. And the writing of the state constitutions of the 13 original colonies that formed states. Pennsylvania's Constitution was signed on September 28, 1776. Benjamin Franklin was the president of that convention. <laughs> I had a judge tell me when I entered that Constitution as part of the law, she said, look at this, this is crazy. Benjamin Franklin thought he was the president. This is the intelligence of those people making those decisions. <laughs> anyway, of course I was compelled to explain the truth to her, so I go. Anyway, point being is, we in Pennsylvania are blessed because we were one of the 13 that existed before there was a central government. Now all states are on an equal footing, but Pennsylvania's got a big club because we were the ones, the people in Pennsylvania, that created the central government. 
they are in, the central government is to be inferior or at least a minimum on equal footing as the states. And so when, when the framers came out to say, how are we going to work this, all right, we're going to give limited authority to the central government, and the states are going to retain most of it, and the people are going to retain more than that. In fact, the people never give up anything. We just ask those who work for us, just like in any other business, do this task, please. And oh, by the way, we'll give you the funds to do it. But if you do something that we don't authorize, you're out of bounds, and it's not law, and we don't have to do it. Do you understand that concept? That's yeah. how simple this is. So what kind of notification do we have? First of all, you have personal notification or the ability to say no to government. Always being responsible for your decision. If you're wrong, you may spend some time in jail. <laughs> Probably. All right? But if you're right, one would hope that the courts would say, you're right. But more importantly, your neighbors who are on the jury would say you're right. And in fact, say not guilty. That's called jury nullification. One individual on the jury can say not guilty. And if that decision is made because they don't believe that the law is moral or constitutional, and they say not guilty, you walk out of there. Right? But the attorneys have been working really hard for, and judges for a long time to convince everybody that's not true. But guess what? It is true. And that's again a discussion for another day. But that is part of this nullification concept. Individual nullification. One person on a jury can say no and the person walks free. And one state can say no to the federal government and they don't have to implement or enforce a federal mandate. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Well, let's see. Bill just made that up. Well, first of all, what does the Tenth Amendment say? It says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Anybody not understand that concept? All right. The Ninth Amendment, by the way, says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights is not, uh, should not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. That means there's a lot of things that are not in the Constitution that we have the right to do and government can't stop us from doing. They just didn't write them down. Now, Hamilton was really opposed to this. Hamilton was a Federalist, right? And he liked a European-style government. Yep. And he said, well, you don't really need uh, a Bill of Rights in the uh, Constitution because the states have Declaration of Rights, and the, most of the things are going to be done by the states. That was their pitch, all right? And the other thing he said was, well, if we forget one, then that will be interpreted as that the people don't have those protections by the federal government. So we really shouldn't do this. Well, the conventions that were ratifying the Constitution said, we're not ratifying this unless there's a Bill of Rights. And in fact, there was so, uh, so much negative attitude about it that Washington was called upon to say, okay, 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 calm down, ratify it. And the first thing, one of the first things we do, we'll have a bill of rights. Okay? Now, that happened. It wasn't not an easy process, but it happened. And the Bill of Rights, by the way, was ratified on December 15th, 1791. Saturday, is September is December 15th. Did I say September? I meant December 15th, 1791. So this coming Saturday is the 221st birthday of the Bill of Rights. So if you haven't read the Bill of Rights lately, please get it out and read it. And in the effort to get the conventions to ratify, what did the Federalists and to any Federalists do? They wrote articles, didn't they? And they were in the papers, particularly in New York. And you know the Federalist Papers? How many of you have heard about the Federalist Papers? It's a good thing to read, by the way. It's sometimes a little tough. Uh, but nevertheless, very informative. Well, in Federalist 51, James Madison said, in a single republic, all the power is uh, surrendered by the people. All the power that is surrendered to, uh, by the people is submitted, uh, uh, is submitted to the administration of a single government. 
and the usurpation are guarded against by the division of the government into distinct, separate departments. Listen very carefully to this next statement. In a compound republic of, in the compound republic of America, the power surrendered by the people is first divided between two distinct governments, and then the portions allotted to each subdivision among dis distinct and separate departments. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other at the same time that each will be controlled by itself. You understand what he just said? State and federal will check each other. That's nullification. And then the three departments will check inside the two governments. It's first and foremost the state's responsibility to look at what the federal government does, its creation, and say, yes, you had authority to do that, or no, you didn't, and we're not going to do it. The governor admitted that Obamacare was unconstitutional, which, by the way, can anybody in this room point to a provision in the federal constitution, notwithstanding what the court decided in a stupid decision, all right? Um, stupid, that wasn't crazy. Ignorant. Anyway, the point being is, can anyone tell me in the federal constitution where there's authority for the federal government to talk about health care? No. no. Nowhere. Nowhere. So is it constitutional? No. no. Well, why are we going to debate all of the nuances? All right? We've got to focus on the cause of the problem. And the cause of the problem is we've got a bunch of governments at all levels that haven't even read the documents, not studying or understand them, and they certainly don't follow them. And if you're looking for the courts to solve this problem, they're the ones doing it. Now, if you want the evidence, I'll share it with you. But this is a fact. Think about it. If the courts were operating constitutionally, you could go to the court, any court, file a suit against the President of the United States. There would be a jury who would understand that they can judge the law and the facts, and they would, in fact, litigate the facts and the law and probably find most people in government guilty because most of what government does at all levels today is unconstitutional. Okay? And we put up with it. Not only do we put up with it, we pay for it. How dumb is that? All right? So we need to start getting the reins on, and the problem is that government at all levels is not following the law. And when they don't follow the law, it is no law at all. I don't know whether you've ever seen this book or not. It's a Supreme Law of Land book. If you have seen it under a different color, cover, it's the Citizen's Rule Book. Have you ever heard of that book? No. By all means, spend two bucks and get one. Chunk full of good information. On page seven, it talks about this very issue. And I'll give you just a few decisions. How many of you have heard about Marbury versus Madison? That famous decision that allegedly gives the courts this power? Well, read the case. It doesn't really do that. But nevertheless, here's what the court it did say. <clears throat> All laws which are repugnant to the Constitution are null and void. Hmm. That famous case which gives the court so much power says a lot of things, by the way, and this is one of them. I'm sure if you've ever been stopped by a police officer, he's read you something off a little card. I've had that opportunity several times. Anyway, my thing is, I'm a civil disobedient. Anyway, in Miranda versus Arizona, 1966 case, Supreme Court case. Here's what they said. Where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them. Same thing, right? Yep. Yep. So if somebody in government does something that's not law, what is it? Well, here's the general, there's other cases, but here's one. The general rule is that an unconstitutional statute, though having the form and name of law, is in reality no law, but is wholly void and ineffective for any purpose. Since unconstitutionality dates from the time of its enactment, and not merely from the date of its decision so granting it, no one is bound to obey an unconstitutional law and no courts are bound to enforce it." End quote. <laughs> They're enforcing all sorts of stuff that's unconstitutional, right? So don't look to them to solve the problem. So who can make the ultimate decision what's unconstitutional? Can't the sovereign? Isn't that the final authority? <coughs> you and I have to do that. And we have to instruct those in government that it's their constitutional duty to follow those documents. 
Their oath of office is found in Article 6, Section 3, and it says in Pennsylvania, I, name, shall, will, uh, do solemnly swear or affirm to support, obey, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth and to discharge the duties of my office with fidelity. It doesn't talk about following court decisions. Uh, even though you're an attorney, you don't have to do that if you're a governor or a representative or a senator. I would suggest you keep reminding them that. I do that quite frequently. They don't necessarily like it. But the never necessarily fact is, when a governor gets elected, he may be an attorney, but he follows the Constitution first state constitution and where applicable the federal constitution and oh by the way many laws are written that apply to corporations but they don't apply to us but they call them persons anyway all persons about it out persons can be artificial entities so read laws with an open eye point being is we need to start reminding governor corbett and anybody else and everybody in government which by the way i do quite frequently in writing we all need to understand that they work for us and we instructed them this on this uh, exchange, and they made a decision not on the Constitution, which is what Corbett should do first, but he didn't do it, because the court called it a tax. You're right, doctor. <laughs> if we buy that decision, they can tax anything and nothing. That's what they just said, because in the Constitution it says they can tax, right? It's one of the provisions in Article yeah. 1, Section 8. They can only tax things that they have authority in the Constitution to tax. And doing nothing is not one of them. All right? And health care is not one of them. Insurance is not one of them. If it were, wouldn't we be able to buy insurance across state lines? Yep. Oh, wait a minute. Can't do that. Because states incorporate companies. And insurance companies are incorporated. They're state incorporated entities persons by the way all right so they can't do that so that will tell you that the federal government doesn't have any authority because if they would they just do it they're not going to do that because they have no authority to go across state lines to make insurance they say we've got to do that in some bill before and they didn't do it they can't do it the state's not going to give up that authority because it's lucrative <laughs> okay anyway i would suggest that nullification is alive and well, and we can make it happen. And they always say, well, you'll be breaking the law. Wait, wait a minute, I just told you that if it's unconstitutional, right. it's not a law. So how are you breaking the law? Exactly. All right? Sorry. So, individual so individual nullification, county nullification, if you will, jury nullification, <clears throat> can, you can do it in your township. You wanna do away with Agenda 21? Oh, yes, yeah. we do. That's unconstitutional too, by the way. So is zoning. Always has been. Could never apply to you and your property. That's against the law. Now, if you'd like to have a lecture on that, I'll be glad, or a discussion, I'll be glad to talk about that. But the point being is, there's a case where the government's gone awry. How in the world could they tell you how high your grass could be, or what the color of your house would be, or how much water you could flush, if they had authority to come on your private property? There's one of two things. Either you don't own it, or they're breaking the law, or maybe the law. both. <laughs> anyway, the point being is zoning has always been unconstitutional. So here we have an opportunity now to go to the state level and instruct the governor and the legislators what notification is. We started doing that, when I say we, the county sheriff brigades of Pennsylvania and the various people involved across the state uh, started doing that on January 31st, 2011. We had been working, uh, actually, uh, do you know Jim Compton? He's from Cumberland County. Uh, he's the coordinator for Cumberland County, but he's involved in a number of other things. He may have gotten his emails from various things. But he was fought fighting Real ID uh, for years, in fact, almost six years. I started working with him about five and a half years, uh, half a year into that, when he was doing it. And we used to hand out things pretty much every week to different groups. You know, somebody was working on the bill, for real ID. You know what real ID is? Yes. 2005, the federal government says everybody's going to have this uniform identification, <coughs> driver's license, whatever, and if you don't have it, <coughs> you know, the sky's going to fall. All right? And then they put the date off, and they put the date off, <coughs> because the state said South Carolina started, no, we're not going to do that. By the way, South Carolina started nullification in uh, the 1832 time frame. Calhoun was going to have a fight. 
Anyway, can't get into the whole history of, of nullification, but the bottom line has been going on from the very beginning. In fact, it started with Thomas Jefferson and, and James Madison saying that the Alien and Sedition Act, particularly the Sedition Act of 1798, was unconstitutional, and that uh, Virginia, Madison, and Kentucky, Jefferson, writing the resolutions that they would not do it. They would, in fact, nullify. Jefferson coined that phrase. Uh, Madison called it interpose. That the state would interpose between the federal government and the citizens, and they would not enforce the Sedition Act. And they called the Principles of 98. That's what that was called. And Madison wrote a report in 1800 and explained it fully. And then he changed his mind when he was almost on the deathbed. But he actually didn't change his mind. Because remember, I read, I read to you what he wrote when the Constitution was being uh, ratified. All right? He clearly said there was this power. What he concluded was the tax that was being imposed in South Carolina and other places in the South was constitutional because it was interstate commerce. It was 40% at the farm, by the way, on cotton and tobacco. Somewhat high. And the South Carolinians said, we're not going to do this. They're ready to go to war. Jackson was ready to come and suppress the rebellion. And Congress lowered the tax. And so the South Carolinians said, OK, we'll take the 20% and we'll deal with it. So they didn't go to war. And if you study it, you'll find out that taxes was the cause of the war between the states. Slavery was important, but that was not the cause. At any rate, so we're going to look at nullification and I can give you some examples of what it is, but I think I'd spend the rest of my time talking about this. I said that we've been doing this, uh, instructing those in Harrisburg since January 31st, 2011. There I wrote a personal letter to the governor, lieutenant governor, AG, and all the senators and representatives. We hand-delivered it, along with a copy of another book that's over there, it's well worth it, of The Victory for State Sovereignty, which is the summary of Sheriff Richard Mack's case against the Brady Bill on the Tenth Amendment basis, where he won. Now, just to encourage you, the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia, wrote this, and this is his finding. Went, uh, excuse me, wrong page, right idea. This is the order of the court. We held in New York, that was a 1992 case, that Congress cannot compel the states to enact or enforce a federal regulatory program. What do you think health care is? <laughs> hmm. Today, we hold that Congress cannot circumvent that prohibition by subscri uh, subscripting the state's officers directly. The federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems, nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions. What's a political subdivision? Counties, Counties school boards, uh, okay. um, to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. It matters not whether policy making is involved and no case by case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. Compound republic. Get it? That, this decision has already been made. We're just not arguing it right. It's unconstitutional and we need to stand together and instruct constantly those in government <coughs> to follow their oath of office. Well, this was included with this letter. If you like it, it's online. You can get it at our website. It's um, sheriffbrigadesofpin.com. And I can write it down for you. I don't have it released. But all of these documents are on the website. All right, that letter, then it was nullification. It's the rightful remedy for, to Obama, for Obamacare. I did a reprint of a nullification in a nutshell. There are 10 articles specifically on Obamacare and the court decisions and why it's totally unconstitutional. As an example, I find this incredible, and very few people know this. When the House passed the original bill, it had a number. When it went to the Senate, they didn't do that bill. They took another bill which had nothing to do with health care, they gutted it, and they put the Senate version in, and that's what they passed, and that's what became 
Obamacare. Now, the last time I checked, since the infinite wisdom of the Supreme Court said it's a tax, those bills have to originate in the House. Well, you see, they were already planning the shenanigans, weren't they? Why did they do that? The IRS is going to enforce it, and they got all these fancy schemes. Well, I say it's time to say no. Okay, on that line, on that point alone, it's unconstitutional. There's about I wrote about five others to support my position that the decision is unconstitutional. <coughs> anyway, there's the remedy to get your local and your county and your state governments to start saying no when the federal government succeeds its authority. And the only way they're going to do that is that they read the document and they study it and they stop listening to attorneys who tell them, oh, that's a federal issue, we can't do anything with it. By the way, they're learning that because Real ID took us five and a half years to get a bill passed. All right? Shouldn't be that way. Gosh. But Jim Compton is tenacious. And as I said, we passed out things generally every week for years. And so they finally, the government passed and signed it. The House and the Senate passed it on the third time around, third, third session working on this. They passed it and the governor signed it. Now it's gutted. The Department of Transportation pretty much implemented all of, of uh, Real ID, but nevertheless the bill passed. So if anybody says that nullification doesn't work, well, let me see, Real ID worked in Pennsylvania. All right, there's a bill that says we're not going to participate in Real ID. So don't let anybody tell you it doesn't work. It has worked and it always worked, uh, if it's truly understood. The last document that I handed out, which was on the 4th, Jim and I, is the title of it, the United States Supreme Court uh, decision, well, that's not the last one, sorry about that. The last one was, Pennsylvania must reject any state health insurance exchange. And we give these out to everybody. It's 256 uh, documents, and I'm, right now it's total confusion in Harrisburg. We <coughs> hand out all of them. But the bottom line, it takes us about an hour and a half, two hours to get around to seeing everybody. Depends on how much we talk with them. But the point is, you can do that. I think one of the questions that's floating around is how can we go and lobby our, uh, our uh, government? Go do it. Doors open. You know, make an appointment. Go do it. We would encourage you to learn more. I'll give you that website one more time. Sheriff Brigades of Penn, P E N N dot com. Sheriff Brigades, Sheriff Singular Brigades, plural of pen.com and I'll I have a lot of other documents I'm published up in Carbon County every Saturday um, and in fact this one is uh, happy birthday to the Bill of Rights is the article I'll close with this and I hope we have any questions how many of you remember Edmund Burke's statement and by the way it's carved on the steps to the Capitol that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men, and I, clearly that includes women, most importantly, to do nothing. You're not doing nothing. You prove that today. This is just the beginning. First of all, they're going to bring it back. And Katie's right. He has another decision to make in, in uh, February. What we do need is, unfortunately, in the, if they were to follow the Constitution, there would be no need for any legislation. There's a statement made in the congressional record with dealing with the so-called 14th Amendment, again a subject for another day, and Judge Perez from the Louisiana Supreme Court made this statement about nullification, if you will, with respect to things that are unconstitutional, and I quote, the Constitution strikes with nullity that which does violence to its provisions. Oh, I love that. The Constitution strikes with nullity that which does violence to its provisions. Anything that's unconstitutional, as we've read in court decisions, is null and void. Obamacare is null and void as a matter of law. The problem is we've got a whole bunch of people in government, particularly run by attorneys and judges, who say, oh no, it's a tax. I suggest we stop doing nothing. Obviously, you are not among that and start saying very loudly together across the entire commonwealth no we're not going to do it you know by the way 
Um, I realize that money talks, and there's a lot of powerful people, a lot of money that want to do this to us. But there's more of us than there are them. And they got to get us to do it. If they say there's no one, I'm going to be a middle class, I hate that term, there's not supposed to be classes in this country, but a middle class tax increase, that is a blatant lie. All right? There isn't enough rich people to fix this problem. All right? So, they're all lying to us. And if they raise the debt ceiling more on time, we ought to be marching on here on uh, Washington. Well, what does that do? Nothing. But they all ought to be turned out. Every one of them. And the House can do this. It's the only case that they can say no and it stops it. Would it be so bad if the federal government, well, it's not really federal government, the United States government shut down? No. no. <laughs> Notifications over there. Uh, constitutions are over there. Um, Sheriff Max, County Go uh, County Sheriff of America, Last Hope. A lot of good information. Please stop by before you leave. And uh, I hope you have a lot of questions for us later. Um, if I could uh, invite Dr. Nick up for a few minutes, I know you guys are just dying with questions. If you'd like to ask them, we could just uh, not spend too much time on it because um, we got to probably be out of here in about a half hour or so. Uh, if you'd like to just uh, ask them some questions. Um, during that time, we also have a 50-50 going on. So after, I guess, the Q&A, we're going to um, have our closing announcements. So if anybody would like to start off, um, stand up, raise your hand. All right. Why do we need insurance? The old days, we didn't have insurance. Uh, communities got together. Uh, my uh, grandfather lived out in the Keysport. He was uh, an Aust Austrian and Ukrainian. They had a thing called Soyuz. In their church, the people got together. If someone was ill, they funded that person. And I recently saw something uh, online. I, a doctor, a surgeon, somewhere in the Midwest or wherever, he said, forget about insurance. I'm going to do it on my own. So he eliminated all of the paperwork in his office, and he just had people working to provide health care, period. Why isn't that a, 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 a model? Yeah, I mean, in fact, it's, that's, that's where the solutions are. We spend more than enough money for everybody to get plenty of good health care. It's just the system is so inefficient. But the reality is that just like your auto or your home, you know, there are catastrophic events that you need to be prepared for. So that type of insurance I think is necessary. But insurance as a, as a payment scheme does not work. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Adrian, you had some questions. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, do you know much about the, the ACOs, the accountable care organizations that are, that are a part of, of, of Obamacare? Yeah, I mean, the idea is that uh, it's sort of prepackaged care that the, the, the hospitals and doctors get together. But if you think about it, it it's really sort of a perverse for the, <coughs> at, the, at the patient level. Because what they're saying is, Geez, the more you withhold from the patients, the, the more we'll pay you. And the reality is, um, if, if, if the patients are in charge of their own care, that is the financing, if the ACO is the right model, that's where they'll go. But if it's not the right model, you know, the, some, some other um, group of doctors or hospitals on the, on the supply side will come up with it. So I, I have no problem. You want to try an ACO? Put it out there. Let the market.